by distinguished and learned speakers from all around the globe. And we look forward to gain an insight into your knowledgeable views and observances. It's my great privilege to introduce you to Sri S. Chandrasekharan. Sri S. Chandrasekharan holds 37 years of experience in IPR and a very well-known personality. He has been the member technical judge in the IP Appellate Court. He has also contributed his experience as the Controller General of Patent, Design, Trademark and Geographical Indication. He has also been an examiner for patent and design for several years. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our honorable guest, Sri S. Chandrasekharan on the stage. We welcome you, sir. Now may I request Dr. Rajesh Acharya, Managing Trustee of MarkBatten.org, Dr. Mario Sergio Golab from USA, and Mr. Ryo Iwatani from Japan to come, to please come on the stage. Welcome Dr. Rajesh Acharya, may I request Mr. <laughs> Thank you, sir. We'd like to request Ms. Neelam Gadani to present flowers to Dr. Mario Sergio Golab. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'd like to request Ms. Femina Manyar to present flowers to Mr. Rio Iwatani. Thank you, Ms. Manyar. I'd like to request Ms. Dikshita Bhatt to present flowers to Sri S. Chandrasekharan. Thank you, Ms. Bhatt. Let us now continue with our plenary session. Today we have gathered here to get some ideas about the side of intellectual property, which can be acknowledged as expertise behind idea of how knowledge can influence imagination. It is my privilege to introduce you to Dr. Mario Sergio Golub from Golub Intellectual Property USA. Dr. Golub has graduated as an aeronautical technician and helped build the first composite fiber glider in Latin America. He worked as an engineer in Israel's LAVI fighter jet project and also worked at NASA. At University of California, Berkeley, he studied design of very high-density integrated circuits. Dr. Golub received his master's in international management degree from Thunderbird School of Global Management and worked as a director for Latin America for Seagate Technology and later as vice president of Rackle Datacom. He then received his Juris Doctor degree and also a postdoc degree in intellectual property. Dr. Golub became the first patent attorney registered at the USPTO from Latin America. After gaining experience as a patent attorney at a top US law firm, he founded Golub Intellectual Property to offer his combined expertise in engineering, <laughs> business, management, and law. Dr. Golub serves as a World Intellectual Property Organization lecturer and consultant at various universities and governments. To speak on business and legal anti-counterfeiting strategies, may I please welcome Dr. Golub to come forward. Yeah. Uh, Marunam Mario Golubche. Pan <laughs> Maru uh, um, uh, Gujarati Manu. Uh, Mario Golab Jamun. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for uh, inviting me to lecture before you and actually going to share some of the knowledge, uh, some of the um, ways of fighting something that is very interesting. Um, I'm going to be talking about uh, counterfeiting. Before we resolve a problem, we need to define it. We need to understand what counterfeiting is. Okay? So, I would like just to know for the audience, who of you is, excuse me, so simple, very good. Who amongst you is a lawyer? Please raise your hand. So we have a few lawyers here, not too many. So I'm going to just review a little bit what, um, what do we have in intellectual property. Let me see, is it working? No, I guess. 
No, lift it. That is not. No, it's not. Okay, there we go. No, I'm going forward, going backwards. Okay, there we have it. Okay, so this is pretty much what we deal with intellectual properties. Fruit of a creative mind. And you can see from this, you have four fruits. Can you read? I mean, you're push your lawyer, right? Could you please tell me what do you see here? What is this? For patents. So we have patents pretty much protect utility things, things that are practical in nature. And then we have here? Trademarks. Trademarks, uh, trademarks are commercial identities. So this is what identifies a product amongst consumers. And then somebody else wants to tell me what is this? Copyright. Okay. And copyright cre protects creative ideas. It's Things that are beauty in nature, they're ornamental, and things that they, they, they serve us to make a life, the world a nicer place to live. And finally, we have the fourth fruit. Can anybody see the fourth fruit here? Or can anybody tell me what it is? Very good, trade secret. And the reason you don't see it is because it's a secret. So, what is the trade secret or industrial secret? It's how we do things. How do we, con who our customers, our suppliers are, how do we process um, our internal process in the companies, okay? So this pretty much is the, the head of, the, the product of intellectual property. It's the product of a, um, a fruitful mind. So as I said, we're going to define what the problem is. The problem that we have is counterfeiting. Counterfeiting is pretty much taking something from somebody else. Somebody created something, we're going to take it. Why are we going to take it? What, what should be, what's the benefit for a counterfeiter? Anybody can tell me? Money. Wealth. So we're going to, I would just want to share with you to so understand what is the history of wealth. Very simple. Initially, our humans literally were hunters and gatherers. So in order to be wealthy, you will actually, the, the, the wealth came from natural resources. Pretty much 100% of that was natural resources. In order to be wealthier, you will take from somebody else uh, the, those hunting grounds and whatever, and, and we will use a tribe to conquer this. About 15,000 years ago, agriculture developed. And with agriculture, suddenly we, we stopped being nomads and we became sedentary. And in order to control agriculture, in those days, we thought 95% of the wealth came from the land. And that was, that's what we have 95% of natural resources. But how you planted the space, the water, whatever was required, that required knowledge. That knowledge is the 5% of intellectual property. In order to be wealthier, you require an army soldiers, people that go and fight and take somebody else's land and that you become richer. Let's go forward and suddenly Gutenberg invented the printing press and guess what happened? Those writers and everything, they took a year to develop a book, now it could be done in a week or less. So we are taking somebody else's creation, manufacturing and we got the book. But really the, the wealth became evident when the invention of the steam machine, which actually transformed things and moved things forward. Suddenly, we can put it on ships, we can put it in different places. F to control that, now we're talking about that 40% of the wealth came from natural resources, only 40%. You have to have the knowledge, 60% of the knowledge, to create the machines, to transform that steam into moving things and to create wealth. Now, you don't need an army anymore. Now you need a navy. Why do you need a navy? Why do you need diplomacy? Because you want to open markets and you need to distribute that worldwide. And that wealth made a small island in the middle of nowhere with a terrible climate, awful food, uh, an empire. I guess you guys know something about it. You kicked them out in 47. Not too long ago, actually, we, we became the wealth moved from the land from the industry to something called intellectual property. Intellectual property uses only 5% of natural resources. And that means human resources, not human capital. The human capital is part of this 95%.
There's a difference between a human resource and human capital. Human resource is the person who does things. Human capital is the person who thinks and creates more innovative processes. Now, we don't need anymore an army. There's nothing to conquer. Are you going to conquer a person? You're going to put them in jail, but you can still not extract what is in the brain. The wealth comes from the brain. You don't need the Navy. Things get transmitted through internet, so the wealth gets redistributed in an easier way. What we need is a court of justice. And we need generals, like lawyers, that will go and fight the fight. And only a judge, only a judge can determine the wealth. Just imagine a judge disassembling a company, saying, you're dissolved. Suddenly, billions of dollars are gone. L let's assume that a judge says, that a trademark is gone or a patent is invalid. Bingo. Billions disappear. You don't require an army, you don't require a navy, you don't require anything. So you see that right now, what is the motivation of counterfeiters? It's actually to create wealth by stealing intellectual property. So we have a problem and we're going to focus on what's happening next. Okay. What are the sources of counterfeiters? How does it happen? What most people talk about is forgers and piracy, meaning people that will take a product and copy that. That will be the source. But these are like mosquitoes. They're badder and they, they're, they're everywhere and you can't get rid of them. Even though we're gonna, I'm going to share with you a technique of getting rid of a mosquito. Okay. There's also uh, another way of doing uh, of counterfeiters, and that's, uh, that happens by something called gray market. Gray market is you intend to distribute the products in one channel, let's say consumers, and then you sell it to maybe some resellers at a different price, and those resellers, they don't encounter a market, they resell back to the consumer market at a different price, so you're competing against your own product. And that's called gray market. That's a way of counterfeiting, and that is much larger than the mosquito problem that we have. Also happened with reimportation. You export at a, some beneficial pr price, suddenly the market that you expected to, to conquer with that beneficial price doesn't develop. And what happened with the product? Okay, you reimport it, or somebody else reimports it, because this is a difference between the market price and the imported price, and bingo, there's a, there's a problem of, of counterfeiting. And this is the biggest problem, original manufacturers. You'll see in a second when I'm talking about trademarks, why there's such a huge problem. Okay, we're going to talk about, uh, as lawyers, how do we combat that in, in, in a general sense. The, the easiest tool lawyers have to do that is called cease and desist letters. So we send them a letter saying, hey, we have a right, an intellectual property right, it's registered here and there. And, and you're infringing on this right. So please stop doing it, otherwise we'll do something to you. Okay? And this is a basic thing. Now, who's going to listen to this? Some medium-sized company. Somebody who has something to lose. Is, will a mosquito listen to that? No way, Jose. A second means of doing it is controlling borders, custom enforcement. So you go to your custom official and says, a dear official, here is I have a trademark, or I have a patent, or I have some copyright, and these products that are coming into this country are violating my rights, please stop them. And normally people are trained, you register them, and the customs, what it does is actually stops them and destroys the product. Also, because right now the, the world is not, a distributed, is not distributed through actually brick and mortar stores, the world is actually doing things through Amazon and eBay and Alibaba and so many other uh, companies which we get some logistic company to deliver the product. This is a very important of blockage, both to assert your rights and both to defend your rights. So we need to work with the distribution companies. And finally, this is the most costly of all. If you want a soldier to go to war, you need to feed them, you need to pay them. If you want a lawyer to go to war, it costs a lot of money. The war is fought at a court of justice. There's no army. Two countries that deal with heavy intellectual property, they will never litigate. They will never go to war. Because what, is, what, do you take, what type of thing are you going to take as, as a prisoner? A person? Yeah, you can squeeze their head, but nothing's going to come out. Okay, 
Now let's uh, talk about how do we do, we're going to go into the practical aspects. What do we do? We register or we try to acquire the rights by registering in the country that we're going to sell. Why is that? Anybody? That's where the money is. People are buying our product, so we register there, so we, when we sell them, we have a, we have a protection. Um, I'm not going to get into the specific, I know a lot of people, many of you are not lawyers, but um, in order to extract a premium for something, uh, intellectual property right is a form of monopoly, which gives you exclusive rights. And that's the reason you want to register those rights in the countries where you sell. And in the countries where you source the product, where it's manufactured, you want to protect it to a contract, not intellectual property. And the reason is because if you're going to go and somebody's going to uh, sell your product to the side, they're violating specific, you can write whatever you want in that contract. When you subscribe to an intellectual property right, the, the government tells you what that right is. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to very quickly evaluate, you need to evaluate all the intellectual property rights that go into to protect. You can see, okay. We're going to go with a case study. We'll go something practical. Okay, what I have here, and you can buy it, it's a really nice product. It's a cell phone holder. And I'll pass it along in a minute. I'm just going to give you, show you what it is. Actually, this belongs to a client of mine, so this is a real case. I'm not making this up. And uh, you can see that the space that is here, there's a nice booklet. Um, it has um, some trademarks and have some pictures. I'll pass it along so you can, uh, you can take a look, observe what it is. Okay. So we're going to work together to see how do we protect this. Here's a client coming to you, or you yourself are, have an invention like this. What, what can we do with this? Okay. So here are the many uses of this uh, of this uh, product. Uh, I have I use it myself as a great product that you can buy in the internet. It's wonderful, but that's the reason somebody also thought, "Wow, that's wonderful. Let's copy that stuff." Okay, so we're going to do, we'll see how are we going to protect this thing against uh, copiers of the big ones and how we do it against mosquitoes. That's the forgers and the others. Okay, the first question that you'll, you will ask yourself is where shall I be made? Where do I make this? And very simple, when the costs are the lowest. Okay, so these are cost considerations. Uh, you take logistics into consideration, you take the cost of the product, the cost of engineering, whatever it takes, that's what it should be made. And where should it be sold? Where do you think it should be sold? Where the money is, where the, rev where the earning consideration, where there's more money, that's where you sell it. Are you gonna sell it cheap? No, you sell it as expensive as possible. I want to make money. Now, money, I repeat the word, but let me put it this way. It's not the ultimate consideration. Society benefits when somebody creates something that is useful, okay? Money is just a means of reward for something that is created that benefits society. That's where it starts, that's where it ends. But by people doing that, we all benefit. It doesn't matter who invented something, we all benefit from that. So, okay, so what type of intellectual property? Let's talk about patents. What type of intellectual property should we protect this product with a patent? Anybody? Nobody will protect it with a patent. That's terrible. It's an inventive product. It's very, have you ever seen it before? It's very original. So we could protect it with a patent, but there's a problem with a patent. The patent takes three years at least to get granted. With a product like this, the life shell, the life cycle of the product could be two years. The investment is very heavy. And this is a small company. Should I burden them with the idea of protecting it with a patent? It may not be the, good, the best idea, but there's many types of patents. So a utility, uh, but a design patent, that takes half the time, costs very little money, and it gives me the, the image of having a design patent. So a design patent will be appropriate, and you can have both, a design and a utility. But this is more efficient. So let's go forward. Now we're going to do talk about the trademarks. OK? You saw the name, Bondi? OK? That's a trademark. Should I use anything else? Any other trademark protection? Any suggestions? 
Well, what about the logo? How about, what do you think? Apple? Apple has a logo and a name. Why shouldn't I? So I will actually look at this. I think it's a very nice logo. Take a look. You know, it has the name, has the hands holding it, has the hook, you know, and the hang it on. It's pretty, pretty neat logo. So bingo, I have now a second protection. Any other ideas of protection? Well, let's see if we all recognize this or not. Now, I want you to come, somebody tell me out of your head, what is this, quickly? Coke bottle, that's it, Coca-Cola. You didn't even see the name, here's the name, look at that. Coca-Cola. But you see the bottle, even upside down, and you recognize it immediately. This is called trade dress. It's a way of protecting with a trademark. Okay? So, if you look at the, uh, the program, who has it? Look at this. Use the body as a trademark. So somebody who copies this, and this is a copy of what you have there, is infringing my trademark. Okay? So there we have it. So you have a different type of protection, very inexpensive to do, okay, very creative. And this is a copy. Somebody can take a look. There's this is a bit thicker, a bit different, and flims your cra pretty crappy product, anyways. Okay. Now, any other type of protection? Uh, come on, somebody has to think of some better protection. We talked about all this at the very, at the very beginning. Okay, so we have copyright protection. You see all those pictures? Every single one is protected through copyright. Okay, so in the same product, I already talked about patents, trademarks, trade dress. Now I'm talking about copyright. And the copyright protects many things. Be surprised. First thing it protects is this memo pad. Here's a by the way, you see all the registration? This corresponds to USPTO registration. By the way, there are international registrations too. And I'll tell you in a minute about them. But also the front cover. Believe it or not, some of the uh, uh, infringers actually copy this stuff and put it in their product. They didn't even have, took the chance to buy a product and say, take their own pictures. How dumb could they be? And they get caught to that. That's where you catch mosquitoes and you get big ones. <laughs> Anyways, but there's one more copyright protection. This, what you see here, this is sculpture. So I use it as a trade dress. Now I use it as a sculpture. So when I sue, I sue for copyright infringement, for trademark infringement, for anything, you know. So you get them everywhere. Because in the, juris in the jurisprudence, some um, type of uh, litigation is more beneficial than another. Like, for example, copyright. There is a copyright in the United States, the Copyright um, Millennium Act, which grants you statutory damages. And trademark is sometimes it's easier to, to, uh, to get trademark infringement, sometimes you need to get copyright infringement. So having both helps us. And the cost is minimal. The cost of registration for copyright is $35. Imagine the protection you get. You get millions. Anyway, so through copyright, I protected the sculpture. OK. This is the original price sold in Amazon or eBay, some place, even free shipping. So somebody wants to order that, 25 bucks is a good product. Somebody took it, so it must be a very good product. <laughs> okay, now look at what uh, people see. Wow, this is a great product. I'm going to copy this. I'm going to go to some country and get this flimsy stuff and sell it. And what do they do? Bingo. 1326. That's half price. That's a Matia. That's a great deal. Anybody wants to buy that? Now, the problem is, you think you go to the internet and you see a product for $26, and you see something for 13 points, you know, 1326. Uh, are, are those the same product? Is it possible? So you know that it's not. Something is different, but it looks the same. Maybe it has the same functionality. Maybe, yeah, the quality maybe is not the best. But hey, half price. It's a great deal, right? 
So how do you fight this? How would you fight that? Any suggestions? Anybody has a suggestion? Contact what? Contact eBay. Yeah, that's a good one. I contact eBay and I try to stop that. And that happens all the time. You contact the, the, uh, the distributors, but the, comp the distributors will close. eBay will close or Amazon will close this company and a new one will come out. That's why I call them mosquitoes because they're everywhere. They are impossible to fight. Okay. Any other suggestion? That's a good suggestion. We use it. Anything else? Come on, creative people. We're going to fight this thing. We are the, the generals of this intellectual property war. Sell a cheaper copy, less expensive. Now, here's the very key words. Cheaper copy, meaning something crappier, something worse quality that looks the same at a price that is less expensive than this. Here you go. Even a better price. Now, you are in the market for something like this. You see a product for $26, you look for something cheaper. In your search, you're going to find this, and you're going to find this. Which one will you buy? This. So my client is actually making original, I mean legitimate copies in the sense of the rights, like nobody can kick them out of the market at a price that is so cheaper that this mosquito is dead. Because if somebody is looking for price, they're going to buy this. You see the point? So the only way you can do that is the people that will look for the original, if you go to the streets of Rome, my goodness, or Venice, or any place in Europe, you see all those Gucci bags and all these Louis Vuitton bags for $20. You know that this is, this is a fake product. And it looks the same. You look at the zipper, it's good. And my goodness, the colors and everything looks exactly the same. This is the same strategy. Trying to get the owner of the rice to, to ship, to buy, to sell the product at very low quality. Now, if you're going to buy the product, a, 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 something that costs $1,000 for $20, it's not the same. And the markets are different. OK. Now, we're going to talk about something different right now. We're going to talk about, remember I mentioned that there's mosquitoes and there's also the big infringers. We're going to talk about the big infringers right now, the big guys. The guys that you actually need to go to court and you have millions to fight them. And the guys who actually distort what the globalization is. When globalization came to be, it was supposed to be, I want the best from you, and I give you the best from me. Okay, it will take a long ways to get there, but I will, everybody will benefit from having the best from all the worlds. So, there are some companies that decided to go with a global trademark. So, they will be known worldwide, and we'll look at them in a minute. And those who say, no, we're going to buy market by market. Now, what are the advantages or disadvantages? First, you get recognition, worldwide recognition. That's amazing, you know? So, if you're a domestic trademark, you don't get that. Your advertising budget with global trademark is lower. The, co the cross-border promotion, so if I'm in a neighboring country, people know, travel back and forth, I don't have to do as much advertising. There's the transportation costs are higher because I need, now I have to send you the alfajores from Argentina, the champagne from France, and whatever, and uh, the, the palak paner from India. Except that you have one situation, your local problem suddenly becomes have global effects. So if you have a problem in one market, it becomes global. And you have a risk of trademark cancellation. That's what the big money is. That's what the big problem is. Now, you need to consider several things. Trademark world doesn't, does interact, but it's not the same as a denomination of origin. You can add to that. So we have a product and there are unique qualities on the area. You add the denomination of origin, you have a stronger thing. Now, when you think of champagne, anybody knows a brand of champagne? How about tequila? Any brand of tequila? No, we, most people say that we're not tequila. A brand is not such important. The denomination of origin is extremely important. Uh, each country has, uh, the United States, by the way, does not have the denomination of origin in our legislature, but in South America it exists. I'm not familiar with the Indian legislature. 
Another thing is very important is domain. A lot of uh, people confuse that they okay, I have a, uh, I mean, the internet, presence in the internet is so important, but a trademark does not give you an automatic, a de facto right in the internet. You have to have it separately. And of course, you can have a clear top level domain. Now, let's look at, uh, I have a question. Let's assume everybody likes Mercedes Benz, uh, any other car. Well, let's take Mercedes Benz for a second, okay? Let's assume. Uh, the, I have two cars, two exact Mercedes Benz. Let's take two flowers here. Look almost exactly the same, right? Now, they both cost $50,000 and you have $50,000. So it's not a problem that you, about the money. They're both the same. Now, this is made in Germany with German engineers, German designers, German work, and cost $50,000. This is exactly the same, but let's say it's made in Brazil. Which one would you buy? German, eh? Everybody? My Brazilian friends? <laughs> German, okay. Okay, now the same question, exactly the same question, except that the German costs $100 more. That's it. So instead of $50,000, $50,000, $100, and the Brazilian only $50,000. Which one would you buy? German. Now, what you're telling me is that your perception of German labor is at least worth $99 more. That means the products are not the same. Okay? So labor could be a different thing. Now we have uh, my favorite. I have nothing against Coca-Cola, by the way. Okay, just I want to let you know. Uh, what is this? Anybody? Ah, you don't know it's Coke. You don't see it. You don't know. You have no idea. You don't see anything. Here you can see the straight red. This is a red, bot a red bottle. Now, I'm putting it like this. Now we have Coca-Cola. Okay. Have you got, you drank probably most of this product. It's made, uh, where is it made? Somewhere in, uh, here in the neighborhood. Okay. I live in Miami. In Miami, there's a mixed population, mostly Latinos. We like sugar. But in the United States, they use corn syrup. The flavor is completely different. The water is different. The formula is different. So who is actually swindling me my money? Who's taking my money? Because I want to buy one product. I don't want to guess when I go from country to country what product it is. So this product is actually fake. And by the way, this is fake too. This comes from Mexico. OK? So both are fake. So here we have the formula is different, and the water is different, and everything is different. Now. This is something, if you ever go to San Francisco, there's a bread, it's, it's, a, it's a kind of a sour, sour, it's called a sourdough bread, and that bread is acid in the flavor. It's very unique. And they try to make it somewhere else, it never tastes the same. Why? Because in San Francisco, the air makes it different. So if I were to sell, there's three manufacturers in San Francisco, Colombo's, uh, Boudin, and um, what's the other one? Uh, I'll remember in a minute. Anyways. If this company were to make bread somewhere else, they could actually leverage on the trademark. But actually, it will not be the same because the air is not the same. The product will not be the same. And this is one of the problems of globalization. Having a product that is not the same being sold as is the same. OK. So let's look at uh, companies that are really, truly global. Apple, right? <laughs> Everybody knows that? We don't even have to tell you the name. It's just you see the logo. That's what it is. This company is truly global, designs in, in uh, design places and manufacturing, manufacturing places, sells worldwide. No doubt about it. And here is a company <coughs> that actually, sell, it's a global company. Anybody knows the company? You can see it here, Nestle. Nestle is a Swiss company worldwide company in each market manufactures a product if it exports from one to another the, the, it's a local company making an export to somewhere else they, they manage the trademarks in a proper way so if I like happen to like the Argentinian frigor made by Nestlé I can buy it in Brazil or I can buy keyboard made in Brazil in Argentina or I can get sorbetas from Philippines or haagen from the United States it's not made everywhere However, there are companies, they're cheaters. 
you never know what Coca-Cola is made. You have no idea how the flavor is. If you go from one place to another, it would be completely different. But you buy it because you see the bottle and you want it. So you're, willing, you're willingly being cheated. Okay. So one of the problems is the vulnerability of the trademarks. When you have a trademark, you have to protect it because that's your commercial identity, the commercial identity of your product. And if you, if you play with it, somebody who has enough money, you're going to ask for a cancellation. That's the reason the court of justice, where is, this is where everything is litigated, that's where the generals, the lawyers go there and fight it. And that's where the big wars are the big billions of dollars. If you take a nuclear bomb and destroy all the buildings of Coca-Cola and take all the airplanes and the manufacturing facilities, the company still exists. So there, there's no way with an army, with a navy, with anything, with a tribe to conquer that thing. There's only a judge saying, dissolve. Now, this is an experience I had about um, a month ago. I was in Cuba. Now, one of my favorite beers is called Presidente. And I don't know if you can read here, but see, here it says Con Nac Dom. That's Compania Nacional Dominicana. That's from the Dominican Republic. One of my favorite beers. I was in Cuba. I saw that Presidente. I said, wow, I want one. So I went and paid a premium price over the local beer. And then, uh, typical IP attorney, I started looking at it a little bit more. And what well, you can see from here, but you have to believe me, you, it's probably in the, in the handout. It says here, Guatemala. Now, for those of you who don't know my geography, Dominican Republic is an island in the middle of the Caribbean. And Guatemala is a country in Central America. They're close, but no cigar, not the same thing. And then, I looked at it, it says, imported by the Cuban company. So here I am drinking a product for which they charge me a premium, but it's not original. And that is something this could be fought by a cancellation, like many other things. Anyway, this is a bit of a legal strategy and global strategies. Uh, oh, yes, forgot something else. I love chocolate. I lo Anybody doesn't like chocolate? Well, most people like chocolate. And the Swiss are very reputable for making really good chocolate, OK? So I'm sure they get their things from many places because cacao doesn't grow in Switzerland. But they manage with the, to, with the milk, the technique. They, they make great things. And nothing could be better than Lindor. Lind makes, and it says here, if you can read it, master choc Swiss chocolate. Can the lights be turned off a little bit, please? Yeah, lower the lights in this area so they can see that. OK, so see, master Swiss chocolatier. So there must be a person who is a master man who, or woman who actually makes chocolate. And it's that skill that I wanted to make the best chocolate. OK, so I go and buy this stuff. And here is the product, the other side of the product. And I look at here and I say, what is this? Let me amplify this for you. Manufactured in USA by Lind in Stratton, Massachusetts, New Hampshire. Slicha. So, here this product, it's a fake. Because it, does, it probably uses milk from the USA. The people who do the work are not Swiss, like they are not Germans, the one who made the car. And I'm paying a premium for this. So if I was, now why all this is important? Let's assume that I want to start a business, making a drink or a chocolate product. I will have to compete with this worldwide marks. They're actually cheating people by selling a, a, a product that's fake into a market. I have an uphill battle. I will never be able to go to a supermarket and try to sell this product because the supermarket says, who knows you? And besides that, what price are you going to sell it? How many millions do I have to put in advertising before I can get recognition and, and the supermarket will have shelf space for me? It is the companies, if the company will sell the product from Switzerland, or from Atlanta, or from whatever it is, then I do get the very best. It will be, my disadvantage would be that I'm an unknown. But my advantage is transportation and many other things. And perhaps flavor. Maybe I, I get to acquire somebody else's taste. Anyways, I want to answer a question that the uh, Vice Chancellor said before. What's intellectual property? It's not just a way of making money. Intellectual property rights are rights that society gives some of the members of society, the creative members of society, for the benefit of all. 
And it's not only a way of making medicine, making you have a better life. When you invent a new medicine in one country, it benefits the whole humanity, not just that country. So we allow certain inventors to, uh, and creators to benefit financially, and that's an, an incentive, so they will benefit society. And after a limited period of time, those rights become worldwide for the society. And when you register, then it's your exclusive right, but if you don't register, that's free for all. Okay? Thank you very much. Shukriya. Namaste. Thank you very much, Dr. Golub, for providing such an insightful presentation on anti-counterfeiting. Thank you very much, sir. Now, as a gesture of thanks, I request Sri S. Chandra Sekaran to present memento and certificate to Dr. Rajesh Acharya. Again, I request him to present a memento and certificate to Dr. Mario Sergio Gola. Again, I would request him to present memento and certificate to Mr. Rio Iwatani. Thank you. 